Ned, as I mentioned, is the CFO of Twitter. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the issues that we've been discussing at this conference regarding Twitter. But I don't want to start there. I want to start with the business. All right, sounds good. So you've been there two years. Uh, you heard Jenna Messerschmidt earlier, who had been at, who preceded you at Twitter, talk about what some of Twitter's problems were. I think you agree with her assessment. So let's start with you talking about that. Explain what the problems were that she was referring to, and what the management team that you're part of has been doing since then. Well, I thought she described it really well. There was a time when Twitter had gone astray, when we were less clear what our purpose was, whether you were a consumer who wanted to learn about the NBA draft or something around politics, or you were an advertiser who wanted to reach your customers. And we, as you chase other things, you lose your focus and you start to forget those things that you heard about from Jennifer and Sasan when you are customer obsessed and stay close to what your customers really want your product for. And I give Jack a ton of credit because it's been almost four years that he's been back at Twitter. This is Jack Dorsey you're talking about? Correct. And when Jack came back to the company, he really helped us simplify. And we got down to clear jobs that people hire Twitter for. We talk about consumers using Twitter to stay informed, to discuss what matters, and to inform others. And we talk about advertisers using Twitter to launch new products and services and to connect with what's happening. And that clarity helps a ton because you can use it for resourcing. You can use it to make tough calls. There were times where we used it to close down whole parts of the company. And the focus that that provided us has really helped us change the trajectory, which led to much better user growth over the last couple of years than we had before that, which ultimately led to much better uh, revenue growth from really helping advertisers deliver on what they were looking for too. Talk about a tough call as an example of that. So there was a business called Telepart that we had acquired for over $500 million, which had over $100 million of revenue. And uh, we bought it and closed it within a couple of years uh, because we had bought it with an investment thesis that it could help us with off-platform advertising and even some on-platform advertising. When it became clear that the thesis wasn't valid, when it became clear that focusing on protecting that revenue, even if it wasn't core to the business, could be such a big distraction that it could hurt our ability to get the rest of the world to use Twitter, which is really what ultimately will drive value for all of our stakeholders. Uh, the tough but clear call was made to not sell the business, not wind it down, but to really close it and to move on to other things as quickly as we could. And your point is that this focus on, focus on what matters is what enabled you to do that. Another management team at another time might have come to the same decision but may, maybe not as quickly or, as with, or with as much clarity? Well, some might have said, this, this is revenue and we paid for it and so we stubbornly might stick with mm -hmm. it and we're gonna make it work. Others might have said, the path to success is through diversification. Others might have said, this is a talent challenge and not a, a strategy challenge. And uh, starting with the product, starting with what made Twitter great and why people came to the service really gave us the clarity we needed to execute much better. So Twitter's going to report earnings fairly soon, so any numbers that Ned talks about today will be old numbers, and I'm going to, I'm going to just give some quickly. The last time you reported earnings, you have 134 million daily users, which was up 6% from the previous year, I believe, or the previous period. It was up 11% from the previous, the previous year. Okay, and first quarter earnings were, up, were, were $191 million, which was three times the previous year. That sounds about right. And revenues were up 18%, $787 million, so almost a $4 billion run rate for the company. You know, again, looking backward, being respectful of, of where you are in your, in your quarterly cycle, what accounts for the improved financial performance of the company? It really comes back to that focus that we were talking about. When you have a clear strategy, when you're clear on why people use your service, when you're clear on how you can deliver for advertisers, uh, then you hire people who believe in that purpose and that strategy. You execute against those things and not against other things. When you add resources, we grew headcount 16% last year after having had rifts in 2015 and 2016. You're hiring them to just pour gas on the same fires as opposed to, to expand and, and do new things. That helped a tremendous amount. Now, user growth came first. As people came back to Twitter, and we've had DAU growth of between 9 and 14. I'm sorry, daily active user. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, we've had growth in the people who use the service every day between 9 and 14 or 15% for each of the last 8 or 9 quarters. 
it, as advertisers see that, they start to come back and trust and the conversations with them become much more constructive and we've delivered for them much better than we did before. You told me that the whole management team read a book. Do you remember, t you remember the book I'm talking about? We've read a few books, but I think Competing Against Luck is yes. the one that... that Competing uh, Against Luck, the story of innovation and customer choice. Why did you all read that? It's a Clayton Christensen book. Yeah, it's, it's one of the books where uh, Clayton Christensen talks about the jobs theory. And he describes how McDonald's wanted to learn why people ate milkshakes so they could figure out how to get them to eat more. And they learned from listening to customers that it wasn't about dessert, it was about long commutes and rewarding themselves and that it was easy to eat with one hand while you were driving. The equivalent for us was learning from customers why they use Twitter. And that's where we came to uh, staying informed and discussing what matters and informing others. So we use the jobs theory uh, as many other companies uh, who probably are speaking here uh, today and, and during the conference do as well. Uh, before we leave the subject, uh, high level, how has the company culture changed in the two years that you've been there from what you can gather? Well, the culture has uh, continued to evolve. I don't know if it's fully changed. Um, we've always been a group of uh, kind people who believed in the purpose, uh, but as Jack has been leading the company now for almost four years uh, since he returned, uh, I think his, his imprint is on the culture in a way that uh, he feels really good about and where he's hired um, many of the people. I think half the company has arrived since I arrived to just give you a sense of how over 4,000 people turn over at a technology company and, and the headcount growth that we've had uh, since then. And so we've been very intentional that we want to hire kind people who believe in our purpose, who uh, want to come to a place where they can move the needle and who uh, we pride ourselves on having a really flat organization and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So you've talked a little bit about the product from the user's perspective. Talk a little bit about the product from the advertiser's perspective. And I'm particularly, I mean, you have, you have two major competitors for advertising dollars, Google and Facebook. I mean, at least two, and, and maybe you want to characterize that differently. And so talk about the product focus for advertisers at Twitter and how, what your pitch is on the differentiation with, with the competition. Well, remember the digital advertising market's over $100 billion a year. Last year, we were three billion of that 100. So we both think about that 100 billion, but we also think about the other 100 billion, which is spent offline, as the opportunity for us. And so when you're three billion of a 200 billion dollar market, you don't think that much about whose pocket you're going to take it out of. You instead think about how you can deliver for your customers in a way where they can achieve great outcomes because if you do that, they can spend a lot more with you, whether it's through a growing online ad market or through choosing to shift how they, how they allocate. We have talked to them about launching new products and services. We've talked about connecting with what's happening. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, launching a new product or service. It could be the new um, Amazon series HANA which came out, they put one episode out around the Super Bowl as a teaser, and they did a ton of publicity around it on Twitter because they knew that we have the most valuable audience when they're most receptive because they knew a lot of people were on Twitter during the Super Bowl, and they really wanted to get people talking about it and be a part of where the conversation was around their new service. Uh, another one is when phones, new phones come out, uh, whether it's from one manufacturer or another, uh, there's a whole, it becomes an event in and of itself. And whether you're writing a review around the phone, you're advertising the device or the store where you sell the device or the case for the device, uh, there's a tremendous amount of advertising and a whole bunch of conversation around those on Twitter. Connecting with what's happening, the Super Bowl is a great example of this. It's an iconic event that we think about a lot here in the States where about half of our revenue is. 30 of the 38 advertisers during the Super Bowl were on Twitter at the same time. Now, as the CFO, I wonder where the other eight were, but I'm quite <laughs> pleased that 30 of them knew that the best way to amplify their message and to be where their customers were during the game was to also be on Twitter. And to be clear, when you say on Twitter, you mean they were spending money advertising on Twitter, not just engaging on, on Twitter. That is correct. A lot of them engage as well, but that means they were paying us too. <laughs> Talk about the World Cup, the, the, the recently concluded World Cup and what you did with, I believe, Budweiser? Well, I'm, I'm, the Budweiser example is failing me, but I'll, I'll tell you something about the finals. We had three and a half million tweets on the day of the finals about the World Cup. And the World Cup, because it's a global event, because it happens um, over a, a month or so, because teams are coming and going, because there's also a lot of commentary about things that aren't happening on the games that, that players and fans 
and political figures are talking about, um, there ends up being so much conversation on Twitter. And we work hard with the content owners to make sure that we have the highlights on Twitter because that's where the conversation is. And it, it's funny, if you thought back to World Cups from four, six, eight years ago, uh, Fox or FIFA would have thought they never wanted to have the highlights somewhere like Twitter because they thought, well, if you show all the goals, nobody's going to come to watch the game. And they've realized that we just amplify their message and we help bring people to their service in a way that uh, I don't think they appreciated we could before. Um, do you want to tell the Budweiser story? I don't, I don't know. know the, no, I, I know that you did something with Budweiser, but I don't know. I don't know the Budweiser story, so I don't want to. I'll tweet about it later. Okay. <laughs> You mentioned that half, about half your business is in the United States. We think of Twitter as being this like, iconic American product. Where, where does Twitter do well outside the United States? What are your best markets, and, and where aren't you that you, need, that you want to be? We want to be everywhere where people care about topics and events, where people care about the things that are happening right around them, and, and the things that are happening far away that they could only know about because of something like, like Twitter. We want to be in all the places where people want social, real-time, personalized topics and events in their hand. And so that means we want to be everywhere. Uh, the, Japan has been our, our second largest market from a revenue perspective, uh, but we've seen uh, growth, and again, I'm just referring back to the March quarter when I talk about these things. We've seen growth that we're really pleased with in many emerging markets, Brazil, Mexico, India, the Middle East are great examples of places where uh, we've grown recently, but where uh, there's lots more opportunity in front of us to help people find out about the topics and events that they care about most. And you mentioned you want to be everywhere. You want everybody using Twitter. You're, 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 you're in the neighborhood of 100 million users. Facebook has billions. Do you, do you realistically think you can close that entire gap? Or, or when, you, when you talk about these things, would you be happy somewhere in between? We, the company's purpose is to serve the public conversation. When you look at how the objectives that we grade ourselves against are written internally, we talk about getting the world to use Twitter. Now, we have to start somewhere, and there'll be a, a path along the way, uh, but uh, we've got a lot of work to do to, to get the whole world to do it. And we think a lot about that when we hire people, when we maintain the culture, when we think about the offices and where they should be, when we think about the platform that we use to deliver the service, we think about trying to create something that can be around forever and can serve the whole world. Well, now that's a nice segue because you want everyone to use Twitter. Some of us would wish a few people would use Twitter a little bit less, um, or at least differently. So you have a euphemism for how you talk about the, uh, the topic we're going to move into, which is called health. Explain what health means to Twitter, and, and because we're going to talk about the, the, the tension that we were talking about earlier in the conference. But you approach this from a, from, from a purposeful perspective. So health is our number one priority from a resourcing and from a mindset perspective. And the way we define health is we want people to trust the information that they find on the service, and we want them to feel safe being a part of the conversation. And so there's so much work that goes into health. And some people have a job where that's where they spend all of their time, and others have a job where they're supposed to be onboarding customers to Twitter, and we tell them, if you see an opportunity to close a door that's being used to create spammy and suspicious behavior, drop everything else you're doing and focus on closing the door. I don't say it to apologize, but to share, last year we actually moved people from the onboarding team over to health. And the onboarding team actually focused on some things where they were closing doors instead because we were really clear with how they ought to spend their so time. So onboarding is getting new customers. Uh, health can be uh, offboarding customers. Or making it or harder to create, to create an account. That's exactly right. So health is something that we spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about because if you don't trust the information that you see, if you don't feel safe being a part of the conversation, then you'll go somewhere else to stay informed. You've instituted two important rules just in the last several weeks. One was that if public officials put up something on Twitter that violates your rules, you will label it as such and, and make people opt into seeing it. And then also if people uh, violate people's, uh, if people dehumanize people in a religious sense, you will, you will strike it. Um, on Sunday, the President of the United States po uh, uh, tweeted something that, that implied to any reasonable person that three natural-born citizen members of Congress go back to where they came from, which is sort of a dog whistle racist comment. That did not violate Twitter's rules. Why not? Let me take a step back, and then I'll come back Please. around to it. So first, 
you're asking the CFO, and although I'm accountable for all the decisions we make, you'd be thrilled to know that we have a really strong policy team and that they make these decisions, not the CFO. Uh, having said that, I'm accountable for them, and so let, let's, spend, uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about them. Uh, second, I'll just remind you of our purpose, which is to serve the public conversation. So whether we're talking about the Indian elections, where 600 million people voted last month, or a political topic here, or a, de a debate between a Giants fan and a Dodgers fan, uh, our job is to serve the public conversation. And that means that sometimes there are gonna be things that people don't like or they disagree with. And we try to create policies and we try to make the policies really clear. We actually just rewrote all our policies uh, during the, the June quarter and republished them so that hopefully people can understand them and know how we will enforce them. Okay, go ahead. So based on those policies, if you see something on Twitter, uh, that means that it didn't violate our policies. Now, we always are thinking about our policies and evolving them. You mentioned two recent examples. We have long had this policy that if a public official said something that violated our policies, we may leave it up because we felt that from an accountability, from an awareness perspective, and to allow people to have a conversation around it, that in order to serve the public conversation, it was appropriate to leave it on Twitter. We evolved that last month where we now will cover it with what's called an interstitial, so you have to choose to see the tweet, and we'll explain what rule it violated. And so that's a great example of where the policies evolve over time. Okay, so you know, you're saying you've, you've tightened, it may not have been to my satisfaction, but you've tightened it per, 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 compared to where it was before. Well, one of the challenges is when you create rules is not everybody's gonna agree with them. We, have, we definitely have tough calls to make, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And I appreciate the fact that you, know, you, you sort of joked about it, but the, by saying that the policy team does this, not the CFO, given this druthers, if it were only up to the CEO, you might say, well, how do we make more money? And that's not the only consideration you're saying. The, we're pretty confident that the way to make more money is to get the rest of the world to use Twitter. You're uh, and, and if we can get the rest of the world to use Twitter, we're pretty sure that we can help advertisers uh, uh, find their customers and do other things to, to monetize the service as well. Who has a question for Ned? I certainly have more if you don't. Yes, I have one right here. You did a redesign today. Can you, uh, you, you Michael Miller, uh, you did a redesign today. Can you explain what went into that and your thinking behind? Sure, thanks for asking. So we did a redesign which actually went out yesterday for Twitter.com. So there's been a lot of evolution on mobile where the vast majority of the Twitter activity is, but many people, often advertisers or people who are really active on the service are using Twitter on a desktop. And we hadn't brought a lot of the same functionality to the desktop. And so yesterday, we brought dark mode to the desktop. We put the search or explore to the right of the timeline. We made it uh, easier to tweet, which is a big focus because tweets are the lifeblood of Twitter. So we want to make it really clear what you want to, how to tweet if you're thinking about uh, joining the conversation. Uh, those are some examples of the things that we did. It's also more responsive. And we think we, we built it in a way that'll allow us to move faster and make uh, more changes over time. So we're excited about getting feedback from all of you on the, the new Twitter that's out there as of yesterday. Isn't that interesting that you, you made, you put new resources into the desktop as opposed to mobile? Well, we, you know, it's been seven years since we've made changes to the browser version, which is too long. And so we've been working on this for some time. And it's a good example where we're proud of the work that we've done, but a lot of the work for us is moving faster. And we know that whether it's around health or around evolving the product, that there's a lot of work we need to do to move faster. But the implication is that the, the desktop and the browser matter as opposed to simply on, on, on phones. A lot of our, uh, most powerful users and a lot of advertisers actually are sitting in front of a computer for a lot of their day. That's interesting. Over here, please. Jennifer Reingold from Egon Zender. Um, Ned, you talked a, a lot about some of the changes that have been made in terms of the policies and how you're addressing some of the speech issues that have come up. I would just like to hear a little bit more about how you made those decisions and who is making those decisions. In other words, how much of it is algorithmic? How much of it is human beings? Are you hiring people? Um, I want to kind of follow up a little bit on the conversation we had earlier today about how one would regulate these things if they did. And, and yesterday with Jonathan Greenblatt of the ADL. So the goal is to have policies that are really clear and easy to understand, to publish them so people can understand the rules under which we operate and under which they'll use the service. To have a product that can do a lot of the hard work and heavy lifting. 
and then to have people behind the product who can help either uh, reactively uh, or proactively um, in thinking through the harder calls where the product may not be able to uh, make the decision. Uh, so uh, that can mean that in one situation you need uh, a group of people on the policy team to make a decision. It can mean another one can be a clear one where somebody asks for help and we know exactly what it is that, that a, a person um, in, uh, amongst a group of people who respond to emails would be able to help from a support perspective and others are simple or clear enough that the product can take care of it. Ned, yesterday Jonathan Greenblatt suggested that social media platforms do five things. Two of them are delay posts so that the algorithms can have a way of, of looking at them and, and a second is uh, allowing third party audits of, of this process that you were just describing. How does Twitter feel about things like that? Well, we've thought about things like delays and um, we obviously don't do them today. Uh, Twitter is real time. Twitter is what's happening. The reason that people, some people ask us why there isn't an edit button. Um, sometimes when people write something, there's a mistake in it and they can correct it in another tweet. Um, somebody else can correct it for them sometimes. Uh, those aren't things that uh, we've explored. There are other things that we've done to try to address health, uh, such as removing tens of millions of accounts for, that were spammy or suspicious in their behavior, uh, such as uh, last quarter we mentioned that 38% of the uh, the tweets that we actioned on that uh, violate our policies actually were surfaced by machine learning as opposed to uh, by people. So we feel like we've made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot to do. You have a constituent in the room, Mark Mahaney with RBC. Go ahead, Mark. Hey, Ned. Uh, there, your chief product person at a conference earlier this year talked about uh, one change coming up, which is making it easier to follow topics rather than just individuals. Is that part of the change that was just rolled out today or yesterday? And if not, when will that come? Something that makes the service a lot more intuitive for, for you know, a large percentage of people who don't find Twitter intuitive? Thanks for asking, Mark. So the topics and events work that we're doing isn't a th one thing. It's years of work. It started last year when during the World Cup, we made timelines around all of the games. You didn't have to guess what the hashtag was. You just started typing it or we actually sent you a notification or put it at the top of your timeline to help you find the thing that you were probably looking for. Uh, that helped a ton, but we still have so much more to do to help people follow hashtags, not just accounts, to make the timelines even more relevant, to notify people about them in a better way. We think there's a ton of work to do around all of those, which we'll be working on for some time. Some of it you can see in the twitter.com that came out yesterday, but other things uh, we'll keep working on for some time. I think I have one back there, do I? Oh, yes, right there, and it's, it's gotta be a quickie, please. Hi, Shannon Hughes from Udemy. Um, so I've seen some recent coverage of, um, this was around Facebook specifically, but for the teams that are trust and safety teams, they often see some pretty horrific things, wondering what it is that you're doing to make sure that those people are, you know, how to make their job safer, essentially. Uh, thanks for asking the question. We take the well-being of the people who work at Twitter or who work on Twitter's behalf really seriously. Uh, one of the things that I get to do is sign the contracts with the, um, our partners who are sometimes um, seeing the difficult things that you're describing. And I'm pleased that I, although uh, there's always, there are always are things that we can learn or do better, that uh, there are things built into the contracts because our partner wants them and because we want them for the person who's having the, to deal with some of the harder situations to make sure that they get breaks, to make sure that they are properly fed, to make sure that uh, they can get counseling if they need it. Mm. Uh, and so the types of things that you would hope for, as much as this is a really dynamic topic, and I think we'll continue to learn how we can best deliver for them, are things that we take really seriously. Ned, super interesting and, and diverse stuff, and uh, we really appreciate your being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you.